This is a production of Cornell University. So, welcome to a very uh, August auditorium here to talk about, uh, I think, an interesting topic. Uh, how, well we do, how well will we do in the 21st century? It all depends on us, essentially. As, as I said, like, just to kind of declare, to start with, as you can see, my name, Matis. Some people, they think it sounds like Malthus. <laughs> And I just would like to declare from the get-go, I have an anti malthusian <laughs> So I will explain why, proper more. To a large extent, because I think we can take faith in our own hands. I think the Malthusians are those who deny or ignore the trends, and then just we go, that's, that's how we see Malthusian outcomes. We can turn these trends around, totally. Uh, I'm an engineer by training. And so often when, um, I get interviewed by, by media people that say, are you an optimist or are you a pessimist? And obviously I say I'm an engineer. <laughs> and like an engineer gets asked, you know, here we design a bridge, is the bridge strong enough? And then the engineer makes calculations and says, uh, I think the bridge needs two more beams huh? to be strong enough. And very, very seldom is the engineer asked, are you an optimist or a pessimist? Why are you so pessimistic? <laughs> he says, I'm not a pessimist. I'm just saying two more beans, yeah, whatever. And that's what I say, just, uh, just two more planets. That's it. <laughs> it's just pragmatics. Um, engineers thrive from or get strong from understanding basic principles. Or in, in, in finance, with the fundamentals. Well, the fundamentals thrive in this situation. If you understand first principles better, you can make much better decisions. That's the, the bottom line. Okay, it's not about pessimism or optimism. And the fundamentals change somehow. In real life, it's more complex than a little machine that an engineer designs. So there are many, many principles at work, and you have to decide which ones are the priority principles because you cannot give attention to 500,000 principles. Those are the top five. And I think the argument I would like to make is that the top five are shifting. There's a new principle being added to kind of the top five, probably. And understanding that will help you make better decisions. So it's all about opportunity in the end. And also that opportunity is that's why I gave you a little uh, tool to take home. Normally you go to events and you have to bring a ticket, you take a ticket home. Mm -hmm. um, the first version was sponsored by the Swiss government, so that this neat little Swiss cross here, which makes it very legitimate. Um, <laughs> and um, looked a bit like a Swiss pocket knife, because somehow it's an intellectual pocket knife with lots of little tools on it, and I will touch them, some of them. And it fits in your pocket, more easy than a pocket knife, won't be taken away at the airport, even though it's more dangerous than a switch pocket knife. <laughs> um, and, and, and you can use it on the plane to kind of tell your neighbor how the word works. Uh, first you make friends, first you make enemies, I'm not sure. Uh, but uh, my wife, and that's always, I, 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 I like to give credit to my wife, she, she came up with a good joke, and that's when I tell it, and then when I record your laughter, and, and I will show it to her. <laughs> if it works or not, please laugh. And yeah, so the joke is the following. It's not as bad as that joke. It's not a good way of getting a joke. But anyhow, so she said, you know, Swiss cheese, no. She said, Swiss pocket knives can cut pretty well through Swiss cheese. But this pocket knife cuts through the oil. <laughs> <laughs> so the idea is a little bit, actually, in sustainability, people say, oh, it's so complicated. It's so complex. I would say it's not complicated or complex, it's just different. It's quite simple. You know, do we use more than what we have? Kind of last. You know that. You know, so that's something new, but it's not difficult. So what I would like to, to do is this time I have the opportunity to talk, to talk twice publicly about, about, at, at, at Cornell. This one is a bit more focused on just what are the economic implications and why would I focus on that? Uh, it's, it's 
a bit of a sour, a sad realization myself in my own life. I'm from Switzerland, and so we try to engage with nations. And we got Switzerland to the point where, where, the, the, where the statistical office is downloading our data after having done some review with us, and is, is, the, is all the results more or less robust, and are publishing the results of the Swiss footprint and Swiss file capacity <coughs> as part of the Swiss statistical office, the stamp on it. And it shows Switzerland using three times more than Switzerland has within its own boundaries. And uh, it also mirrors Article 73 of the Swiss Constitution, which says, we Swiss and the cantons of Switzerland strive towards living within the means of nature. Oh, beautiful. Uh, Swiss Constitution is just intention, it's not law. So. Anyhow, beautiful. And what has been the impact on the political landscape? What do you guess? Looking from Ithaca. Zero. I mean, not exactly zero, there's a bit of talk here and there, some pockets, but not really. Hmm? Uh, why is that? When, I, when I, I, I grew up, the generation after World War II, I was born in 52, my parents lived to World War II. Switzerland had seven months of food per year uh, in World War II. It was surrounded by war and fascist forces. Very difficult. People said, oh my God, what should we do? Ration food and, you know grow potatoes in the garden, didn't really help that much, but kind of boosted the morale. Build a, a, a merchant fleet during World War II on the Swiss flag, having no access to the ocean. I mean, so desperate. I mean, they, they, they took big action. Uh, and then someone who thought about it. So now they say, Switzerland uses three times more than Switzerland. And they say, what's the dinner? Yeah. <laughs> not, not very interesting fact. So that's why we kind of shifted our attention slightly, shifted not by abandoning our past. Our past has been, how can we document resource constraints? So how can we put numbers around that in terms of how much nature do we have, how much do we use? And now we kind of extend that a bit to say, actually, to what extent, what's the evidence that resource constraints, what's the evidence that resource constraints have a material and substantive impact on economic performance and social stability? It's only then I think we say, oh wow, that has an implication uh, that we will see action. What's the, now that seems quite obvious in some ways, and it's kind of surprising to me that there's very little evidence backing it up, really. It's strange. It seems so crucial. So I would like to show you in some ways how we're starting to think about that topic, and it's, still, it's far from conclusive. But uh, uh, so, so I'm really here kind of you know, looking for help, really. <laughs> we can't do it, and here's a lot of brain drops, so I, I bank on it. So how, how do we do that? Our, our, and can you hear me in the back, is it okay? Otherwise you just come closer. Um, we just have two messages as Global Footprint Network. We're an organization with 30 people and only two messages, that makes 15 people per message. And uh, we have two offices that makes one message per office. One in, 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 in Oakland, one in Geneva now. And the message is, the first one is, the short form is, biocapacity is king. And the longer one is to say, biocapacity will be the limiting factor of the 21st century. So if you look at resource constraints, whether it's say, because there are lots of resources, how is it best to think about it? I would say, really, the life happens on the surface. Life competes for these surfaces. Life does quite well without mercury. So yes, mercury or other rare earth may be limiting in some ways, but that's a question of energy, both to get it out of the ground and to make sure it doesn't pollute. So, so energy is a way to kind of deal with industrial metabolism but ultimately it's the <coughs> life force that is limiting. Uh, now we can kind of fool ourselves with fossil fuel, always hard to say, so many similar words, uh, because it can allow us to do more than what biocapacity can regenerate, and we start to recognize there's not enough capacity to deal with the waste. So the waste is more limiting than the source of 
fossil fuel as well. So by capacity limiting, we may have the wisdom to move out of fossil fuel because we're already way beyond 350 ppm. So we actually took that seriously should move out of fossil fuel some years ago, but we haven't had the wisdom yet. Uh, that would make put more pressure on the rest of the biosphere because somehow we want to get energy, perhaps biological energy, or biomass. Uh, or we don't have the wisdom, we burn everything, we've already found, and we find more, but even if we burn everything we found already, Many estimates would suggest that the PPM concentration in the atmosphere would go above. We burn everything we found so far. How much? 1,700 PPM. Oh. And that's, that's when indoor air specialists would say, we should start to ventilate the room. People get drowsy. Now we can't ventilate it that easily if outside there's 1,700 PPM too. But anyhow, so, so it's, it's a significant amount, and that means two things. One is, biocapacity probably will be under more threat. I mean, there will be, maybe there might be some winners, but overall, most likely, biocapacity will go down. And trust, international trust, will probably be seriously compromised in such a situation, because you know, why are you wrecking the, plan wrecking the planet? So international trust is a precondition for a global economy and international trade, so you may be less able to get access to biocapacity from elsewhere. Maybe. So in either scenario, biocapacity is king. That's why we say biocapacity is king. Why king? Because we like fairy tales, even though Switzerland since 1291 hasn't had a king. Where I'm from, uh, we still like kings. So biocapacity is king. It's the first message. Maybe, I don't know if it would work on a t-shirt. It's not that sexy. But I mean, just it's the DNA, I think. Second, what's the second question? And the second message, the second message is actually then if you look at your, well, some of you have already opened it, and you did read the warning, did you? Did you read the warning? Yeah, sure. at your own risk, just in case. Don't sue me. Um, it's uh, this map, which is a bit poorly printed. We didn't get the colors right here. But the idea is, um, if you look at the word like a farmer, if you look the, at the word from a biocapacity perspective, it suddenly shapes very differently. You can see that some countries, some countries have far more capacity than what they use for their consumption. They are really true farms. Others are more like hobby farms, with uh, two chickens, you know, uh, one tomato plant in the kitchen window, <laughs> and then uh, perhaps a rabbit that we don't want to eat. Anyhow, so it doesn't get you very far. A hobby farm. It's nice, but you should have to go and work somewhere else to buy food from somewhere else. But if everybody else is a hobby farm, where do you get? To stuff from? That's kind of the question. So what that says is the second message. The second message essentially is to say, in a world of resource constraints, looking at the world, recognizing biocapacity is king, the national self-interest in aggressively addressing the biocapacity constraints and reducing your biocapacity deficit, that self-interest is overwhelming. I'm not talking about enlightened self-interest. I'm talking about dog eats dog world. You know, if that's kind of don't trust anybody, you're running out of high capacity. National self-interest is overwhelming. Now, what is stunning to me, and I'm looking for an answer and I have no clue, is why could there be such a big policy failure? Why do nations unanimously around the world that their entire cabinets and ministerial support not recognize self-interest question. I mean, some do a little bit more, like China is thinking a bit more ahead. I have a friend of mine who did an exchange scholarship in Swiss uh, in the mid-80s, early 80s, and he got the only heated room among all the Chinese students. And there were also some African students in, in China. Uh, they got medium well treatment, not so, not so well as the Europeans. It's kind of funny how that works out. I thought everybody was equal, but it didn't seem that way. Anyhow, he, got, he was quite happy to have some heating, actually, it's cool. And, um, and um, I asked him, so these Chinese students, what did they study? Oh, engineering. Oh, uh, so I'm sure they offer these courses in French and in English so they can kind of make progress fast because the Chinese want for international solidarity to help their fellow people around the world you know, get technical skills. And no, no, they have to learn Chinese first. Wow, that's, that's more complicated than engineering. I studied engineering, but I could never study Chinese. I mean, so complex. How come? Because the Chinese, they were thinking ahead. Now they have colleagues in Africa where they can, like, 
speak Chinese. So, that's, so, so, so they had foresight. They're one of the few large countries that had foresight. Enough foresight, I don't know, in terms of just are they able to outrun uh, the resource constraints or not. But with some other countries, large countries, that have far less institutional foresight within government. I don't want to name them. They have great academic institutions, great knowledge, but it somehow doesn't translate into uh, administrative foresight. Anyhow, so that's the two messages. Like about this king, uh, the self-interest is overwhelming, and I'm totally surprised that it's not gotten. But the good news really is the potential energy, you know, that's kind of perhaps an engineering idea, you know, potential energy, you know, there's something there that you could exploit. You just don't know yet how to exploit. When there's a lot of potential energy, you just need catalytic energy, and then you can make it happen. So I'm not proposing Sisyphus work. Do you know Sisyphus? Work walks up the hill forever and then can never succeed. It's not a bad thing. Please do the right thing. You will never win, you, but, but you will feel good when you die. Yeah. That's, not, that's not the point. Say, okay, actually, it's, it's a winnable race, uh, but it needs a bit of catalytic energy. It's a minimal catalytic energy. So, um, how do we make the economic argument? We start with what we always had before. Uh, we map countries demand for resources against how much do they have available in their country. And we do that like farmers. We say, how much air is there in the country? How productive is it per hectare? That gives us the biocapacity. So it's kind of a, how much share of the global productivity is in your country? That's one part. And the other one is to say, okay, how much area is needed to regenerate the flows you depend on, both for providing resources, for accommodating the space that you pave over for your beautiful roads and buildings, and the capacity that you need to absorb waste that competes. I mean, if the waste is absorbed like a cow that poops on the, on the pasture, the absorptive functions are overlaying with the productive ones, and so it's not a new area. But if you have the industrial mode, you produce corn in one place, you ship it to Holland, they feed pigs, and then they destroy the, the water, and they're like, they, 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 they use two areas for the same thing in competition to kind of provide the services. Uh, now, the main waste flow in, we calculate in our international calculations because of lack of data, CO2, CO2 is kind of an emission from fossil fuel. Uh, uh, and the question is how much pie capacity would you need or do you need, because some of it is absorbed, to absorb this flow. So these are kind of all competing uses of uh, nature. So as I said, so we, can, we, we, we do everything per capita, not everything. But per capita is kind of interesting because people look through their own eyes. That's how they experience the world. And so per capita, what you see typically, and I take Italy as an example, Italy had a slight decrease in biocapacity because there are more people to a large extent, uh, and their demand of footprint went up quite substantially, particularly since they entered the EU. Um, so they used about one and a half Italy's in 1961. That's when the United Nations started to track uh, data quite consistently, country by country, 1961. Today, they use about, I think, four or five Italy's, I can't remember exactly, but something like that. I think between four or five Italy's, they use. What's the problem? Have you been to Italy? It's quite nice. It's kind of a prime tourist destination. People think there's great food and local food and slow food and wonderful Exactly the point. There's no problem. <laughs> Apparently, they think, oh, they have a bit of a deficit problem, things like that. So, when you look at this, and Switzerland looks a bit flatter, so Switzerland looks like this. They increase a little bit and they kind of stabilize Switzerland comparatively. And Switzerland also has a higher GDP, so kind of relatively speaking. What's the problem? So, so that's why we said, okay, we need to translate it into economic language. And just to say the following. What does it cost? What does it cost to run this biocapacity deficit? And the answer is nothing. 
that's kind of interesting. Each of them can buy for each of it, and it doesn't even cost them anything. So they do something that is physically not replicable worldwide, and don't get a signal back to say, wow, there's something kind of that doesn't add up. So in the past, if you look at resource cost trends, you, you saw the resource cost overall, they were kind of more going down the slope thing overall. You probably know the famous bet between Simon and Paul, uh, uh, between Simon and Paul Ehrlich. There was a bit of a blip in the 70s for the, for the oil prices. Uh, and, uh, and now since the year 2000 though, uh, the prices are going up again. Now would they go up forever? I don't know. Uh, so because prices, or, okay, now I know. <laughs> I learned the hard way. <laughs> prices, people say scarcity make prices go up. You heard that saying? It's a deep belief. And uh, what people mean by scarcity are different things. It's true, like in the, on a market, if it gets scarce, typically then the price goes up. But if scarcity in the world, like the resources, Bigger. That doesn't necessarily translate into market price. Like if you measure the voltage at the plug here, it doesn't tell you if there's enough coal forever to keep the voltage up. So there, there's the two different concepts. You have how much stuff is there to replenish the market, is the market, and if the market gets good, yes, the price reacts. So there's a much more tenuous relationship between here and uh, the, the, the stock. So still, I mean, eventually, you may see prices go up. There are actually very interesting studies that, that looked at. Did the price predict the extinction of the near extinction of the buffaloes or the beaver? And it didn't. Now, till the last one, the price went back again and suddenly it's gone. Oh my god. Where are the buffaloes? Where's the millions of them? Uh, so so uh, in the best cases, prices go up, then you can react. In the worst cases, prices don't go up. And then you suddenly have disruption. You know? So the price is going up is a good thing because it gives you information about the future. And if you are not well enough informed, then the price is not yet. Okay, uh, now prices are going up. What is also interesting, that's what Jonathan Gra uh, Grantham pointed out. For the first time, prices, in the, the recent history, prices of resources go up during a recession. Never happened. There you have so the price go up. So now if you multiply prices by amount of buy capacity deficit, what you see for Italy, okay, the, their cost was relatively minor to the GDP, it, but now it's multiplying. Prices go up and the deficit goes up, so it multiplies it into going up bigger and bigger. So even though it's a small part of the GDP, it's becoming steep enough that you can say the downward escalator is going faster and faster, and they're not able to run up anymore that easily. So it, it, it comes to, it starts to compete with the size of, of growth. So they cannot, so, 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 so basically it makes it more difficult because the resource constraints are becoming a cost that draws them down. Now, what we were quite shocked to see, it's a kind of very rough analysis of costs. If you look at some former Soviet republics like uh, Uzbekistan or Kazakhstan that have quite low GDP, I'm not sure if Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, uh, if you calculate their energy consumption at world market prices, that cost is higher than the GDP. Can you imagine? Their energy consumption at world market prices is more than the GDP. That's stunning. How can you say resources are manufactured? It's more than everything. <laughs> In some ways, that's just the energy cost. So, uh, so kind of surprising to me to what I said, energy uh, resources are not yet seen as, as a major driver. So that's one thing of saying, wow, yes, in the past it wasn't a major, major factor and as a factor it was actually declining in importance, so yeah, maybe it may have been reasonable, reasonable not to think about it, but it's hard in the future to make that argument, particularly because it's not easy to move out of, out of your ecological deficit. Because that's given by your population size, doesn't change that quickly. It's given by the way your infrastructure is built, doesn't change that quickly. So overall, you know, so you're kind of stuck. And also world market prices, you cannot manipulate that easily. So overall, it makes it difficult. Now, another way 
of looking at it is to say, okay, that's the cost, but it may be not so significant. So what perhaps we, we were able to add and either. So another way of asking the question is to say, does Italy have the financial capacity to bid for all these resources? How is their ability developing to bid for these resources? And that also brings us to a shift of the past and the future. The past was about, I would call, the factory work, the simplified way. And then if you have a better way of framing it or, or, or naming it, let me know. I call it the factory word because in the past, you earn more money, you want more cars, you buy more cars, the factory produces more cars. The more cars you buy, the more cars are being built. So all that matters is absolute income. It's a factory word. Now, we're moving into a new word. And I would call it the global auction. Why global auction? We are one happy global community of one global economy. We are all drawing on the same resources. The surface of the planet hasn't been expanding very rapidly. Okay, we can produce a little bit more per hectare, but not that significant anymore overall. I mean, by productivity on average has increased about 20%, agriculture being a big boost, but overall, you know, by productivity is not moving that much. So demand is increasing much. So, so we all are looking at the same resources. More and more countries run ecological deficits and they want stuff from the rest of the world. So what's what's the consequence? We are all bidding, we're all sitting in the same planet, we're all sitting in the same room, bidding for the same Picassos. And they're not being painted anymore. We can't live without these Picassos. Because they are the cherries and the tomatoes and the, the things we want, you know? The lowest and the highest bidder. Lowest and the highest bidder, yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's a bidding process. What makes it, it more likely that you what makes it more likely that you succeed in bidding? Of course we're having steel nerves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I would say in simple terms it's, it's, it's your relative income. It doesn't matter how much you have, it matters also how much do all the others have. Mm -hmm. So what you need to know is not how much your talents earn, but what is the average Italian slice of the overall earning power? And how is that developing over time? If your slice, your relative slice is getting smaller, does it make it more likely to get the same amount of the resources? Actually, the talents work more and more. So, so if, you, if, you, if you just look at that trend, what you see is kind of something like this. Actually, we have the trends about the statistics. About a 40% loss for the Italian in terms of their share to its word. So, tell the story again. Italy wants more and more from the word. Not only that, they want more and more from the world, and it gets more and more expensive per unit. Not only that, their ability to purchase relative to others gets less and less. What do you call that? I don't know either. I wouldn't call it a good plan. Uh, something structurally that is kind of out of whack. So, that's a, a big economic argument. Is how can we say you know, that there's, there's no link between economic performance and social? Uh, the, the, well, how can we say there's no link between economic performance and, and, and resource constraints? It's pretty surprising. You know? Already we're shading off this potential. So let me show you kind of these graphs again a little bit, and then we can have a conversation. So just then. So we start again from just saying. We're living in a new world. If you look at the world like a farmer, the self-interest is becoming obvious. Um, I, I apologize, I know some people have a hard time seeing green and red. So the red countries are kind of the, the, all the ones horizontal from the United States, Europe, North Africa, India, China, Japan. 
the population belt, the temperate belt, uh, with far larger demand than what, what they have. When I was born, and that was just kind of not so long ago, 1962 I was born, the world looked very different. So, so we are in a new ball game now. It's a new, it's a new context. So here, Italy. I think it's about fivefold. It's about now down to one hectare by capacity per capita. Uh, the graph. You show that to the Italians, they say so what. So it is Swiss. They say so what. At this point. So how did we measure that? Again, just to repeat, it's basically. It's actually this is a graphic that the, the New Zealand government produced, and I kind of like it because you can't really argue with it. Okay, we use surfaces. You may be arguing why, why do they use Arnold Schwarzenegger as a model, but otherwise, I mean, there are many people obsessed with Arnold Schwarzenegger, but apart from that, yeah, we need surface and it's competing for space. Uh, this is the World Bank pink sheet. The World Bank looks at commodity prices over time. Have you seen this, this, this graph? Yeah. You can download the data from, from the World Bank. Uh, you see the peak in the 70s of the prices, you know, so kind of this declining commodity prices and this increase more recently. So you multiply that with the biocapacity deficit, then you get a sense of where we're heading. Hmm? Now it may not continue forever like that, I don't know, I'm just saying. If it doesn't, then we are even more oblivious of this disruption because there's this, that's, I mean, that's a strange thing. I said it already, you know. Italy not realizing that they are in a physically difficult position because the price doesn't tell them anything in the past. Here, the graph of Italy's, of, of the Italian's share in world income. So, again, they use more, and the blue line shows they have less and less. Uh, obviously, also, the share per capita worldwide is always less because there are more and more people. That exacerbates. But basically, if you bid, it doesn't only matter, you know, if you want, if you, it matters how many are out there and how much do they have. So if, the, if per capita everybody has still the same, but they double as many people competing with you, it makes it more difficult. Here, just a, a, a four different countries looking at to what extent is the share of the American, the Italian, the Chinese of world income? These are not my inventions, really. I mean, the, the point is only we, we, we just downloaded the information from the World Bank on GDP. It's not like something cooked up. It's just a question, how should you look at the world? You know? So if you look at the graph, if you, live, if you continue to live in the factory world and say, that's the world, then you just look at this graph. Oh, GDP is rising. What's the problem? It's good. Yeah. You include it. Only once you start to look at from the auction world and say, wow, what, what do we have to look at? And that's really the question any pilot or any air, air, uh, aeronautic engineer asks themselves before they build an airplane and say of the dashboard, what does the pilot need to know to safely operate the plane? That's, that's the question, and, and so you need to understand what context is the plane in. You know, if you, if, you, if you fly in the fog, you have to look at different types of dials than if you fly, kind of, or if you're just trying to land, or, you know, so it depends on what the problem is. You know? uh, we see China's share of the world income is rising very rapidly. Um, so it may, may grow even more rapidly than their, the, the growth of their biocapacity deficit. I'm not sure. But still, since their purchasing power or their bidding power is far less than world average, it still means like they are, they are, it's growing so that on the trend side, but it's at a low level, so that also makes it more difficult to buy. So it, it, it helps. As a trend, it's probably better to kind of have more and more relative to others. And um, uh, in absolute, it also matters. But as a strategy, like for Italy to say, okay, what you actually you really should do, if you want to stay on this growth trajectory of having more and more biocapacity deficit, you need to outcompete everybody else in the world forever. It's a great strategy that works just for the one at the top of the pyramid. It's not a replicable strategy. So if you think you can outsmart the rest of the world forever, 
be my guest, and that's the good strategy for you. There's some who think so, but it's not a very stable strategy. Anyhow. So let's look at um, some European examples here. Uh, for all you internet people, this kind of the extensions are kind of the countries. Hmm? We see a number of things. One is, I think, one of the big misconceptions is that we all sit in one boat of resource constraints, and so why should I care? Because we are in the same boat. We're not in the same boat. We are, all countries have very distinct patterns. It matters how you relate to these resource constraints in order how to, you will navigate the future. Uh, and um, you see Italy again that I showed before, the middle, smack in the middle. And it's kind of similar to four other countries in patterns. Four countries here have quite rapidly expanded their, res their, their bio capacity deficit over the last few years. And these numbers only go to 2005. We have some newer numbers, but just you don't even have to look at the newer numbers. And surprise, surprise. Yeah. Surprise, surprise, what also are they known for, these countries? Economic collapse. I mean. So if you expand your demand and don't have the purchasing power to kind of maintain it, it's just dangerous. Hmm? So we're just now engaged in a project with um, the finance industry. That's why I have to go tomorrow to uh, Washington for a conference. Um, just to look at that and say, because currently credit rating is blind to resource constraints. That seems silly, really. So let me perhaps just summarize, and then we can have a conversation more. Uh, here's some countries in the Mediterranean region, and the red ones are China, world, United States and then the average med, yeah, all the other ones are Mediterranean countries. If you look at them and say, okay, how has their GDP increased? And how, does that, how has their bio capacity deficit increased? So the bio capacity deficit for most has increased quite dramatically in the Mediterranean. Uh, and they also have increased their GDP. So Lomborg would say, great, the more deficit you produce, the richer you get. What's the problem? <laughs> so it seems to be a good recipe. What's, what are you worried about? Um, And you can see like the United States rather flatter, so as large to increase. So from a factory perspective, you say, okay, what matters is my income, I can buy more. Or you look at it from a perspective of the global auction world. And this is not about correlation or anything. You just say, there's actually a double whammy. Countries run more and more by capacity deficit. While for most, they also run a smaller and smaller sliver of, uh, of, of biocapacity, of a smaller and smaller sliver of biocapacity, no, smaller and smaller sliver of global income. No, so that's the other. What's the average Chinese sliver of global income? What's the average American's sliver of global income? over the last, I think it's the last, since 1970, I don't know exactly anymore which <coughs> year it starts. I think this is Cyprus, we're not sure if, if, the, if the data is strange or not. The long, the long arrow is Cyprus, oh, they have a little bit more sliver overall, but much, much larger by capacity deficit. Are they better off now than they were before? I don't know. So what's the practical implication? We call it slow things first. It's a very simple idea. If you track our demand, the red curve, compared to number of planets, in the past, we went to from, about one and a half, from about half a planet when I was born to about one and a half planets now, roughly. So it depends a bit on how exactly you calculate, but roughly. Um, and if you look at how will it be in the future, we don't know. But we just translate moderate United Nations projections. Moderate, not the aggressive one, moderate ones. Say, so what do we think will happen? That's the United Nations say, and they say, okay, we'll move towards using two planets very quickly. 
Is that physically possible? I'm not sure. I'm not confident it is. But that's our wishful thinking, our most moderate wishful thinking. So then the question becomes for investment. When you put stock in place today, what kind of investments should you do? Which ones will become traps? Which ones will become opportunities? Those investments that depend on cheap resources to operate them will lose in value if resources get hard to get by. It's pretty straightforward. Could distinguish. So we can choose, do we want to build ourselves? Do you want to lock yourself in with your friends or with your enemies? Yeah. Because infrastructure decisions lock us in. That's just the way they are. <laughs> so again, so, it's, so, it's, so we have choice. Uh, last thing I want to say to show is kind of, uh, but we can leave that for discussion. Actually, I won't show it that much, but you, you can, I won't go into that, just let's have discussion. Let me summarize here. I think two, two points I would like to make. One is the planet has a budget. How much do you have? How much do you use? You know, it's kind of useful to know. Um, like President Clinton said in his presidential campaign, you know, it's by capacity, stupid, in the end. That's the 21st century. Um, and if we don't recognize it, the blindness already now does cost lives. And we miss enormous opportunities. That's kind of the bottom line, I think. So what I want to say is fundamental, understanding fundamentals helps you make better decisions. There are huge opportunities out there that you could seize. Um, why don't you seize them? So simple. So with that, that's the conversation. I would also like to circulate something else with, for you. Those interested in stay in communication, we have a newsletter uh, of, uh, on, that, that where we kind of report on kind of new things. If you're interested in it, you can put your email on this yellow sheet. And, uh, See how we fail in the future. <laughs> and just put that in the back. And now it's open for questions. And there's already questions. Excellent. Tell me about it. If you are at an auction, okay. I understood what you asked is if I could explain better why is it relative income and not absolute income that matters in an auction. If we all depend on something essential that we cannot be without, like a Picasso cannot be without, uh, there's a limited amount. You 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 want to get a certain slice of it, you know. So if others have a lot of purchasing power, you cannot bid them out very easily. So it depends not only how much money you have, because it's not a fixed price. It depends on how much money all the other people have to bid for it. So we know a certain point in time how much the Italians could get you know, from that global bidding. And then the next year, let's assume that the Earth is still as generous, there's still as much available but people want more, and at the same time, relatively to the others, you have a smaller sliver compared to everybody else in the room. Does that indicate it will make it easier or more difficult or too difficult to get your amount of resources? So that's why it's not just the absolute, it is kind of everybody wants. That will determine how much you can secure for getting your bi capacity deficit. So having a bi capacity deficit in a world in overshoot you put yourself at the, at the, at the risk exposure uh, of, if you cannot outcompete the rest economically, you cannot grow more rapidly your economy than the rest, uh, then it's difficult. And, and that's the, my point is not to be pro or anti-growth or anything. I'm just saying 
in a resource-constrained world, growth may come to a halt. And then it makes it even more difficult to kind of operate. So you, does that address the question? But, yes, so we have three questions. So we start here, and then we move on. Should we start from my left to the right? So yeah. As you mentioned that uh, Switzerland is taking no action on this uh, fire capacity deficit. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm slightly. Yeah. Sure. yeah. Uh, what countries are you looking toward that are leading the way in addressing this problem? So Switzerland takes some timid approaches, and I think you can't take full credit for that. For example, there's an initiative called 2000 Watt Society where they say now we use about 6,000 watt per person, the United States about 10,000 watt or 12,000 watt per person, we need to move to 2,000 watt. And it's still mainly driven by moral ideas, saying it would be a good thing, not by saying, oh my God, Switzerland can operate without energy, and, and we don't have any fossil fuels in Switzerland, and it's going to get more difficult, and which is surprising. You know, so it's not seen as much as a competitor, just kind of move. Some start to talk about it a little bit, but it's still very timid. And that surprised me, because it's really, it's Switzerland without energy is dead. Um, which countries, have, I think, I had the most interesting conversation, I think, in two countries. One is United Arab Emirates, who are supporting us as well. They have a much more elaborate relationship to wealth, generally, than most other countries. So they, they pump oil out of the ground. They recognize it's not income. It's a transfer of assets, and so they put the money into bank accounts. Um, and they have seen so much change in the last 40 years that they're not afraid of change. They know there will be a different future. They know there will be a post-carbon future. And so it's not a taboo. They may not act accordingly fast enough, but I mean, they're buying up a lot of sustainability experts. They're hedging the betting. They're hedging their bets. Uh, another interesting topic is Ecuador. has been very innovative beyond the footprint as well, and has recognized to some extent with the planning industry uh, that moving out of an ecological deficit is fundamental to their success. Uh, have they been able to act upon it? This is kind of, the ministries have been a bit wobbly and people are fired and then we come in and so it hasn't been as strong in the follow-up, but it's still alive. <coughs> But it's surprising to them. That's, for me, it's a big surprise to say, if truly, I mean, I mean, you may be totally wrong, but if it's true that there's such a strong self-interest of the nations, why are nations not jumping to it? And it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a framing question. I mean, I mean, I would say to the Europeans, we're so utterly stupid that I went to Copenhagen. That they said, Uri Soto, 27 countries together. <laughs> We will reduce CO2 emissions 20%. And if other people participate, we'll reduce it 30%. And I think it's so utterly stupid, institutionally stupid. <coughs> so basically, when you communicate to the world, you say, it's a lot of it. I only fix my boat if you fix your boat. They should say, if nobody participates, we'll go much further because there's so much at risk. We cannot afford it. We take it seriously. We do it no matter what. But to make it conditional on others, you know, say, what's the good will happen? You have to be a good boy, I'll be a good boy. It just shows that institutions haven't understood what it's all about. It's totally war. And, and 27 countries are behind it. The news doesn't laugh, NGOs don't laugh, academics don't laugh, everybody says, wow, oh, you are. It's crazy, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you were next and then. Yes. Oranges, yes. tomatoes, 
the, the numbers I showed were all consumption. There's not something to production. Everything that is produced for other countries is, is subtracted. Now on the tourism side, we have been able to distinguish that so well. So if a Mexican comes to Spain and drinks a lot of beer, it wouldn't be counted as Mexican consumption, it would be counted as Spanish consumption. So that's a distortion in our calculations. I know there are huge flows of tourists coming, but I don't stay for the whole year. So the numbers of tourists become exactly compared with the number of population. So, but it, I mean, it, it's a bit of a distortion, I, I agree, and it could probably be ironed out a little bit. In terms of strategies, what should we do? I mean, I think, I mean, it's not any different from if, if you go to the accountant and the accountant might say, wow, you're spending two times more than what you earn, what do you need to do? We very quickly know what it means. I mean, then you can look at the books and say, okay, what are the advisors? What are the costs? Where can, can we increase our income? Can we decrease our spending? It's pretty straightforward in some ways, but I think first we need to want to change. And, and, and I think that's what I mean by Switzerland, they don't really think that it's, it's significant. I mean, it's, it's a deficit that they don't think has a cost or a consequence. That, I think that, that needs to be understood first at the top level as one of the primary drivers of now, but not so much in the past, but now it's over. I don't know if that counts, but yeah. there are a lot of options for intervention. I mean, there are huge opportunities. Um, I think it's very unrealistic to believe you can produce the kind of the, the, the return on investment rate that we have seen in the 90s in a, in a village economy. But we could, we could build prosperity. We could have comfortable stable economies. We, of course, we try a little bit of everything. We have to try everything. Uh, and at the same time, we are an organization only of, tw of 30. Probably, I, would, I think it would be better to be an organization of 100 people and fill it with about 100 people. That's like half a person per country or something. <laughs> so, so, so that's why we focus our strategy. To say our key audience are 2,000 people in the world. That's what we want to focus on. We have started to. 2,000 people are the economic advisors of ministers and kind of career administrators from our perspective. And how would you change the people's perspective to help people to adapt to the approach of the world slums? Mm -hmm. I'm sure it's very complex, but how might the say that you are the economic advisor and the economic advisor so you can direct the slums? You never can. He said, how do you convince people to kind of change their views or to, to take a bigger share of the pie than others that, that they would change their views? And, and I expect that you can't make people change. And kind of, you have to present them an opportunity and a collaboration that they say, okay, we may, they see the possibility of having a conversation with me as making their lives go easier and more effective and succeed more, sleep better at night. So, so, I mean, the way we approach it is it's through conversations, helping them to kind of deal more effectively with their problems in the, in the end. So, I mean, so going back to Carnegie, how to be influential and make friends. You know, so, so it's like one chapter, and you don't have to read the chapter, just the title. That says, Winning Arguments or Making Friends. One more, and then. Uh, <laughs> okay, sorry. Could you say more about the investments and the, the time scale of the various investments? I really didn't catch that. Okay. So through that Sloppy way, sorry.
So there, so there are two superimposed graphs. One just shows the past consumption, one the future projection, which I think is not feasible, but that's our hope. In such a world, you say, can your investment live in such a world? Most real assets that we put in place today have very long lifespans. So if you put them in place, they basically will determine our consumption patterns for decades to come. And if there's something that requires a lot of resources to operate, they will lose in value. So the net present value of investments that are depending on cheap resources it's probably will drop dramatically if you look at it from that perspective. Does that, does that, yeah. Okay, one more question and that will be the end. Okay. Yeah, so this is crap. I'm not in control of the Human Development Index, and it was revised, and they, so we just used the official way they, they, they put it. And uh, I, I'm not as happy with the new definition that, compared to the old one, but it's another discussion. So now we just said what, the, what, what they define as high development is kind of 0.67 on the scale of the HDI. I know, I know. It's kind of, it's, they say, the rat race must go on. <laughs> but anyhow, so, I mean, we're just saying, okay, if they say that's what we should, where we should get to, do we have the resources to do it? And I think that, that's something that the, the UN, UNTP is starting to struggle with in some ways. They say, oh my God, all the development success we've seen in the past depends on more resources. But now we don't have more resources. How would it end up? And they don't know what to do about that. So it's kind of, This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.